Good morning, church. Good morning. Dr. Tony Evans, in an article on Crosswalk.com, tells the story of Goodyear tires. Many of us ride around on Goodyear tires, he says. Did you know that Goodyear tires were developed by mistake? I wondered how that could possibly happen, by the way. How can you possibly develop a tire that rolls around and gets attached to a car by mistake? But he breaks this. He says, Charles Goodyear inadvertently spilled some rubber he was working with into the fire. And he noticed when the rubber hit the fire, it made a big callous mess, but it was incredibly strong and durable. It turned out he turned this into the Goodyear tire. When rubber combined with heat, it got messy, but it produced a strong, tough product that we now depend on to carry us around. So just imagine that. The, the, in order to prop up a one ton or two ton object, and allows us to roll around and our families around over 50 miles an hour, that was a complete accident. It makes you wonder what you're putting your trust in as you get behind the wheel, doesn't it? <laughs> Who would have thought that someone's failure would result in one of the most important successes of the 20th century? I've gotten to know you pretty well over the last three and a half years, church, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot more to your story that I'll never know. Speaking from my own life, though, I can tell you I see how God has redeemed even my mistakes and has used them to make something beautiful. And not just my mistakes either. The Lord seems to have quite the knack for taking my pain and rooting a tree of grace right through the heart of it. I've never been a big fan of the biblical notion that God causes pain as part of the grand plan. In my experience, human beings are quite adept at making their own messes as we defiantly or absentmindedly throw off the Lord's guidance and protection. Our Creator doesn't need to cause us harm. All that God needs to do is let us reap what we ourselves sow. Nehemiah, in his ninth chapter, verses 26 and 27, retells the story of the Jewish exile pretty succinctly. But they were disobedient, rebelled against you, and turned their back on your instruction. They killed your prophets who had warned them so that they might return to you. They held you in great contempt. Therefore you handed them over to the power of their enemies who made them suffer. And when you, they cried out to you in their suffering, you heard them from heaven. Because you were merciful, you gave them saviors who saved them from the power of their enemies. Occasionally, one of my children and I will start a project together, and they'll decide that they suddenly want to do it their own way. Let's say, for example, that it was a cooking project. They might not listen to Daddy when he tells them not to add that much salt or another spice. And in fact, routinely when we're making a pot of sauce or something like that, they will put a couple extra shakes when I say stop. <laughs> sure enough, they'll eat a bite or two of their creation, and while they may try to fake it for a few minutes and fool Jen and I and say, this is delicious. <laughs> Pretty soon, they suddenly walk away from their plate. And a few minutes later, they're complaining that they're hungry, and Jen and I will have to tell them to go get a leftover from the refrigerator. It's pretty much the same way between us and God. Part of being our heavenly parent means letting us make a few mistakes, celebrating our successful creations, and helping us to clean up our messes. Psalm 80 that was read for us this morning by Don is a song of lament. Because the tribes mentioned, Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh are all northern tribes, it's theorized that this psalm may have been written in the 8th century BC, during the time that the northern kingdom of Israel was being harassed by the Assyrians. However, regardless of the time this was written, the words being used are pretty applicable across any time period, aren't they? God is addressed right at the start as the shepherd of Israel, and as the one who leads Joseph as if he were a sheep. Psalm 80, verse 1. The Lord is characterized as the leader one enthroned upon the winged heavenly creatures, or terror, again, verse 1. The accusatory nature of this psalm tells us that the psalmist blames God for the mess that Israel is currently in. It's interesting how we sometimes blame our leaders for the state we're in, even when we don't follow their lead. You fed them bread made of tears, the psalmist writes. You put us at odds with our neighbors. Our enemies make fun of us, verses 5 and 6. The psalmist goes on to retell God the story of Israel, as if God didn't know. How God brought a vine up out of Egypt and cleared the ground for it and planted it there. That precious vine was carefully shaded from all that would threaten it, but now it seems all is threatened, and those big hands that once kept Israel safe seem absent. The walls have been torn down, and any person or animal can come right in and take the tree's fruit, the vine's fruit. And that's just the way it feels when I make a mistake. Depending on the magnitude of the error, I may feel exposed, 
like my failure is plain for everyone to see, and what little dignity or resources I have left are endangered. There's the mess that I've created, but the worst part is not what's there. It's what's absent. Purpose. Meaning. Confidence. Faith. There may be isolation from the people that we pushed away in order to make this mess, or simply the fear that I'm unlovable because I'm fa I've failed. The most horrible part of our personal disasters is the feeling that we're alone. And that realization that alone, we are insufficient. <laughs> the psalmist refrain can so eloquently express the feeling of loneliness that grows out of our hurt and our pain. The psalmist writes, Please come back, God of heavenly forces. Look down from heaven and perceive it. Attend to this vine, this root that you have planted with your strong hand, this son whom you secured as your very own. Psalm 80, verses 14 and 15. Although God never truly leaves us, the feeling that God is not near to us is like a rot in our soul, isn't it? It hurts. And the most excruciating part is our awareness of what is lacking. However, the psalmist looks to God for hope. Say hope, church. Hope. Did you know, church, that we haven't reached the end of this story? Say, this is not the end of the story. The resounding refrain throughout this psalm is not its complaint, but rather its hope. Show yourself, the psalmist writes. Wake up your power. Come to save us. Restore us, God. Make your face shine so that we can be saved. Again in verse 7. Restore us, God of heavenly forces. Make your face shine so that we can be saved. And finally, in verses 18 and 19, revive us so that we can call upon your name. Restore us, Lord God of heavenly forces. Make your face shine so that we can be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. The word restore that's used here is utilized in other parts of the Bible to talk about the return from exile in Jeremiah 27, 22. And to talk about repentance in Nehemiah 9, 26. David even uses it in 2 Samuel 12, 23 to argue that nothing he does can restore his dead child to life. So we looked at it in this way, we can see that when God restores us, we are brought out of isolation, established into a healed relationship with God and with others. Life is pumped back into us again, bringing vitality back to a world that feels lifeless. It is, in a sense, God's CPR, pumping life into us again and again, and again. Case in point is the story of Lazarus, in which Jesus calls forth a dead man to life, much to the amazement of everyone around. And Jesus points out very specifically that he does it in order to prove to the people how much God cares. Did you notice how the psalmist says that the spirit, this spirit-filled, abundant life comes to us? Make your face shine so that we can be saved. The psalmist repeats again and again and again. Some translations would even say, shine forth. The priestly blessing that Moses gave to Aaron to speak over the Israelites in Numbers 6, 24 through 26 goes like this. You may have heard this before. The Lord bless you and keep you or protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and grant you peace. When someone turns their face to look at you, you can tell that they're listening. Their ears are poised in your direction. Their eyes reveal what their actual intentions are and whether or not they're really even paying attention. Their ears are ready to listen. Their eyes and their hearts hopefully follow. Ancient Israel learned that if God was with them, then they had nothing to fear. They had peace. And nothing can be more indicative of God's presence than God giving Israel God's full attention. Thus, for God's face to shine on Israel means that God is listening. Praise God. Praise God. The process of being restored can be pretty grueling, though, can it? Ask an addict going through rehab or someone receiving chemo treatments, and it's fairly obvious that restoration isn't always pretty. A financial predicament can take years to climb out of. 
It can take a long time to rebuild trust once it's broken. And therapy may take months or even years to help us work through a problem. But as ugly as these restoring processes are, it's hard to argue against doing them. They take work, but it's the acceptance of the problem and the labor that follows that brings about the healing. It's an openness to God's healing grace that allows that healing to take place. In retrospect, we often see God's hand at work in the midst, and it creates a sense of beauty or awe when we look back on it. Surely, despite all of Jesus' attempts to tell them, the disciples didn't realize that they were in the middle of the greatest, most wide-reaching redemption story ever told. That God would humble God's self and become human, to stand alongside and go under, undergo the same things that we all undergo. Live amongst us, teach us, strive to live, and even succeed in living a perfect life, and then be crucified for it. In the ultimate expression of Christ's love for us, only to be resurrected three days later. How could they know that this was what God was doing? Well, Jesus tried to tell them, but they couldn't quite perceive it. How many times have we been in the midst of our mess and been unable to hear that God was telling us, I'm trying to work you through it. Hang on. It wasn't until years later that the disciples opened their eyes to Christ's saving work. Perhaps, though, what yields some beauty out of restoration isn't just found in the rearview mirror. In some of the Doctor shows I've been watching on television lately, a common theme seems to have emerged. The main characters were going through some chemotherapy and were struggling to find themselves in a healing journey. They're all about the end result. They just strive. I say, I want to be healed, so keep giving me the chemo. But they learn from other sojourners on this journey that finding joy and laughter in the middle of their pain can be as important as the goal that they are seeking after. Like the difference between biding one's time in this life to get to heaven and living this life to the fullest in the meantime, there's a profound beauty to be discovered in the journey of being restored, albeit a messy one. When we accept it for what it is, we realize that God's face still shines even in our darkest places, that God may seem far away, but it is still close at hand and still cares about us, and that perhaps we can find some joy in our pain and a little redemption in our mess, to borrow Tom Berlin's phrase. Artists will sometimes use a piece of fine copper wire to string beach glass together into a pendant. And roughly tumbled, each roughly tumbled piece is a reminder of a long journey that that piece has undertaken. But as each painfully refined piece is strung together, its milestones celebrated, its beauty recognized, it becomes a reminder of Christ's abundant, thoughtful love. The key to finding beauty in our pain may well lie in celebrating and stringing together the milestones on the path to redemption of drawing a straight line of grace through them. The business world tells us that there's actually a 40% difference in productivity between the inspired and the uninspired. We'll be more likely to see our redemptive path through to the end to find spiritual will to keep going if we let the Holy Spirit show us how to find hope in our midst and to connect even the smallest of successes on the journey of our redemption. The Gospel of John tells quite clearly the story of Peter's betrayal, how he denies Christ three times, and denies even knowing Christ three times. And yet when Jesus is resurrected, he comes to Peter, and Peter meets him there on the lake shore. And three times, just to parallel the three that he denied him, he asked Peter the same question. Simon Peter, do you love me? Each time Peter responds, Lord, you know that I love you. And these are Jesus' three responses. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Jesus reinstates Peter. In fact, it's even called the reinstating of Peter if you look at the little subtitles that some uh, Bible maker had put together. He gives him a chance to be restored, to be redeemed. He gives him three little chances just to say, Lord, you know how much I love you. Maybe that's the way we find beauty in our pain. Just to say, God, you know I love you. Keep working in me. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen.